two things matter, I guess, is, is freedom and incentives. Uh, and, and that's uh, the, the fact that that's what you care about as well as I care about is why I came uh, to talk today. Uh, and and uh, don't be cynical, I ideas matter. We, we still do live in democracies. Seriam as ações adotadas pelos governos benéficas para a economia? E mais importante, a população se sente receosa em manifestar sua opinião ao discordar das medidas adotadas? Professor, the stage is yours. Uh, I came here to talk about where we are now, and I believe we are at a big tipping point in the international economy, the U.S. economy, and our world in general. One of the things uh, bringing on the tipping point is... Uh, Uh, inflation. So I brought up a graph, my first graph here. I try uh, not to talk too much about the U.S., but I only know the U.S., so I'm sorry I can't tell you too much about Brazil. But here's Brazilian inflation, <laughs> as long as you, you you guys are pretty much having exactly our experience, except plus 2%. My, my thesis is that this, this inflation, which is just starting, uh, is a signature moment, uh, a, a tipping point, and it will painfully wash away lots and lots of bad ideas. Well, let's start a little bit on, on the small part. Will this inflation continue or not? Uh, the fact is uh, the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank are way behind uh, the curve here. And that's what this graph is, is trying to show you. Uh, if you can see my little arrow, the, the federal funds rate is stuck at zero and inflation has gone up to 8%. So from that tra traditional uh, point of view, uh, we're in real trouble. Uh, I think this is a likely scenario that we will do this, something like this, and then it will be followed with something like this. Here is the Federal Reserve's uh, projections. They don't see anything like that coming. No period of interest rates much higher than inflation to get rid of that inflation. You know, what's going to happen? The standard view says where inflation much higher than interest rates is a negative real rate of interest, and that will lead to booming uh, explosive inflation until central banks uh, give up and, and get rid of it. Are central banks just dumb? No, there, there is a new view, the supposed the new Keynesian model which does say inflation will slowly melt away all on its own. Well, maybe, maybe not, but you should be pretty nervous <laughs> is what I'll say. Uh, there's, a, there's an open, it's not a guaranteed. Uh, now let's get to more serious questions. Where did this come from? During the uh, COVID uh, uh, event, uh, here we are, uh, our, this is the US government, and here is M2, uh, a measure of the money supply. What the US government did is uh, literally printed about $3 trillion dollars, uh, worth of money, borrowed another $2 trillion dollars worth of money, and sent people checks. Not only is the economy now at its supply limit, so that further stimulus does no good whatsoever, all spending has to be repaid by taxes. Uh, and furthermore, it's clearly where we came from is, is to uh, excessive fiscal expansion. This situation changes everything. Uh, and then I graphed a little more speculative because, of course, nobody expected this to happen. In the next crisis, we will surely borrow or print another $10 trillion. dollars. That's where debt's going. And here is U.S. deficits, a steady 5% of GDP, if nothing bad happens. Now, what does this tell us? I, I was here to tell you about bad ideas washed away. Let us start with modern monetary theory. <laughs> the theory that uh, money, the government can print money or borrow money or hand it out, and that will never cause inflation because, quote, there is always slack in the U.S. economy, unquote. That's Stephanie Kelton. Uh, we must spend wisely. We must reform to a sustainable budget. In every crisis, we reach to bailout. We all warned it must end. It comes a point where investors won't hold the extra trillions. We just got to that point. Uh, the bailout regime is over. Uh, a new crisis will come. And in fact, one we may be in one right now. Let, let, let me, uh, I, I don't like to be uh, pessimistic, but it could happen. Uh, we, we could have a worse pandemic, but, but right now it's quite possible that this war could get big, much bigger. Uh, the China invades Taiwan, the Middle East explodes, Putin lobs a nuke somewhere in Ukraine, and we're in a real shooting war. Now what happens? That would lead to an immense financial crisis. We're cutting off all the trade in Asia. We're cutting off energy. Uh, stocks are going to plummet. What does our government do? We reach for the stimulus weapon. <laughs> We reach that well of borrowed and printed money. But the stimulus well just ran dry. <clears throat> We still spend money as if there's no cost to spending money. The bailout, the subsidy regime, that has to end. We have to start spending money as if it matters because, uh, because it does matter. The most important thing about economics is growth. 
uh, the U.S. grew from about $15,000 per capita to about $60,000 per capita. But you can see this growth rate is slowing down. These are in logs, so steady growth rate is linear. That growth rate is slowing down. This is a tragedy, and that's not just about buying more stuff. You want to pay for health care. You want to pay for uh, Social Security. You want to pay for pensions. You want to pay for the environment. You want to pay for cleaner air. $30,000 a piece makes an enormous difference. That it is our economic tragedy and the question whether that will keep going. Where did that come from and, and will it keep going? And the question for our time, for our children and grandchildren is will this continue until the magic year 2100? I, I picked that a little bit to make fun of, of climate people because that's uh, the, the, the day we talk about climate change. The little lines here, the IPCC's worst case scenarios say uh, climate change is gonna cost us 5% of GDP in the year 2100. Well, climate change does knock things down a little bit. But climate change in, in, the, in the terms of human prosperity and welfare, it is nothing like the question, does growth go back to what it used to be or does it slow down even more? That, that is the most important. Brazil has a different problem. Here's the US versus Brazil uh, and, and Japan. For the US, the question is that the leading country sclerosis, why is growth sclerotic in the US? Uh, but you can see the experience of Japan and South Korea was catch up growth. Uh, the U.S. has to innovate or reform or do something. We, we have to find better ways of doing things. Other countries have to learn how to do things uh, only as inefficiently as the U.S. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm sad to see Brazil starting to catch up and now not catching up. Uh, but certainly the, the challenge for Brazil is, is why is this happening and not that happening? We have to pay attention to uh, supply. Supply policy is, is, is horrible for politicians. Demand policy is, I'm gonna print money and give everyone checks, yay, vote for me. Supply policy is tiny. It's, it's you have to take Marie Kondo to your national life. You have to fix zoning. You have to fix building restrictions. You have to fix environmental suits that allow too many points of vetoes. You have to fix the fact that in the US it, it takes 10 years to get the permits to do anything, even to put in, in solar panels. Uh, those are hard problems, but that's uh, where we are. Energy is uh, now uh, just a graph to keep you thinking about energy. As you know, oil prices have skyrocketed. Natural gas prices are especially skyrocketing. Uh, the inflation and the war are, are starting. There is a tipping point here, and I think we are, we are hopefully realizing it, but the battle is on. The United States and the European Union have been on an absurd energy policy a trajectory involving uh, ridiculously expensive uh, decarbonization. Now, climate change is real and <clears throat> we have to do something about it. The, the idea was that, oh, uh, the transition is gonna make oil companies bankrupt. Well, uh, sorry, the transition is gonna give huge profits to oil companies because it's gonna make the price of oil go up when you don't allow, when you don't allow development of oil prices, of oil, what happens? Oil prices go up or down, Econ 101 quiz, uh, they, they go up. We're now in a shooting war in Ukraine, uh, but we're not shooting. The big question is, will the West fight? Do we believe in liberal democracy? Or does any dictator just say, I might have nuclear weapons and can get what he wants? What I've shown you needs, it's not hard. Uh, an economics, uh, you know, that this group could sit together and come up with a reform plan that will fix our government budgets, vastly increase supply, get Brazil growing again to catch up with the US and the US growing again like it used to in World War II. We, we could do that this afternoon. But of course, this is politically difficult because so many people benefit from the current system. But it needs a government, a sage government capable of reform. We need to, to, to return to rules and norms, to, to regular order or, or we will fall apart. And, and certainly we need to do that if we're gonna have the kind of long-term policy uh, that uh, is needed to, to solve our economic problems. So we see many uh, COVID policies as well as government policies regarding stimuli. They're supposed or banded to be temporary. But as Milton Friedman once said, nothing is so permanent as a temporary government program. So are there any policies that could be considered good or are they just a bomb about to blow? And if so, how can we defuse them? Uh, our government especially made a fundamental mistake, our Treasury and Fed, <clears throat> in analyzing the COVID recession as a classic lack of demand recession, like 2008, and meeting it with bailout and stimulus. Now, the financial markets were uh, on edge, 
Now, just why, after all the promises of regulation, we had to come in and bail out simple things like money market funds again is a good question that nobody is having the decency to ask. So, so first of all, I think it was a mistake in thinking that the economy needed stimulus. Now, it certainly needed uh, insurance. Uh, people who were, this is a fi fine function, people who are really hard hit, lost their jobs, uh, you know, it's a function for insurance. But we gave checks to every single, I'd like to say every single registered voter, but in fact, we gave checks to a lot of people who weren't registered voters. The idea that you needed to keep it going. So I think that was uh, a first big mistake. Uh, but m m much of that stuff is in fact, slowly but surely ending. I think the larger question is uh, the, the uh, ever, the, the greater and greater expansion of social programs. And the US particularly poorly designed social programs, social programs with bad incentives that keep people on those forever. That's past the COVID thing. That's just sort of the structural problem of US badly designed social programs. Um, do you feel that the government or politicians make use of the public's lack of economic knowledge to pass down policies and legislation that on paper may sound good and are publicized as being good for the economy, good for the population, but in reality create bad externalities as well as bad incentives for the whole pop for the population as a whole. How do we change yes. this scenario? If yes, uh, if the answer is yes. Well, uh, you know the difference I think between an economist and, and a politician and our political system. This is the big one. If you're an economist and you're honest about it, what we know about is incentives. We know how to analyze these incentives. We really have no expertise on who should get what. So I think uh, uh, a better public discussion goes back to a, a more fundamental one uh, about becoming a, a economy based on, on rights rather than permissions. Um, and uh, I think that encodes a lot of better understanding of incentives. And it, it would certainly help to, uh, to talk about incentives. And that's what I think people like us are there to do, to try to bend that public conversation away from who should get and who should, the, the moralistic thing, but to notice that any time you take from A and give to B, that, that gives both A and B horribly bad incentives and, and the, the whole size of the pie gets smaller. If you want to defend it economically, you are providing ex post a kind of insurance, a market completeness. There's a kind of uh, insurance that did not exist ahead of time. And so you can't require that people have bought. And I think that's a perfectly uh, reasonable uh, uh, way. And, and, and you don't want a, a wave of needless bankruptcies you got to ask, why did the companies so leverage that they were going to go bankrupt? Why does nobody have any cash reserves? Why is there nobody around to be the, the liquidity providers? Why do I have to do all the time? But in the crisis, uh, you jump in and, and, and stop things. The way we see this past two years, there was a huge increase in government spending, uh, incre uh, increasing even more the debt versus GDP ratio. And you, you also mentioned a lot about the confidence of paying off that debt. So my question is a little bit broad, but how does this end eventually? <laughs> well, that's a, a, there's, a, uh, <laughs> there's a bunch of constraints. So we, we know one of the possible ways, right? Uh, either we pay off the debt, <laughs> uh, we inflate away the debt, uh, which wouldn't really help because the problem is, the big problem isn't just the debt. The big problem is that we, the US has made promises that it cannot keep about future social security and Medicare. Uh, issues. So even inflating away the debt won't let you pay the, the continuing 5% of GDP uh, deficits that we have. The, 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 the bright way for it to end is a um, supply-oriented policy that gets the economy growing like crazy. And we're going to Congress and saying, well, are you going to raise taxes and cut spending on needy Americans, or are you going to pay interest costs on the debt to fat cat Wall Street people? That's not obvious to me that, that we wouldn't have some sort of debt that uh, debt crisis as well.